Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alexis Conley, Bridgewater class of 99 and MBA 14, and I am the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations. And I'd like to welcome you all to the first installment of our brand new virtual alumni series, Bridgewater and the Influenza Epidemic of 1918, a discussion with Dr. William Hanna. Um, I'd like to begin by first addressing a few housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded for future use, just so that everybody knows that. Um, also, you will see up in your top right corner, there are two different views that you can watch the webinar from. There is the speaker view, and then there's also the full screen view. So please feel free to use the view that you like the best. Um, questions and answers will be available um, throughout the entire webinar. You can post uh, your questions and answers at the bottom using the Q&A button on the bottom uh, chat bar. And if, uh, you know, questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And if there are any questions, if there are more questions than we have time to answer, we will answer the questions after the broadcast and, and post the answers for uh, everybody to see. Um, and I think that is it about the housekeeping. I also wanted to offer to everybody that President Fred Clark, class of 83, unfortunately couldn't join us today for the alumni, but he wanted me to share his well wishes for all of you and hopes to see you all on a future alumni. Um, today, we have two presenters in the house with us, and I would like to next introduce our guest host for our series, uh, Robert Bradley, class of 2012. And I'm going to read you his short bio. Uh, Robert Bradley is the head of Bridge, Re Bridge Research at State Street Associates, a team that bridges the gap between empirical finance research and practice. He is the co-chair of the Bridgewater State University Employee Network at State Street and is on the board of State Street Numerates Network. He is also a part-time faculty member at Boston College and Northeastern University. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Bridgewater State University, class of 2012, where he also majored in English. And he has a master's degree in applied economics from Northeastern University, uh, class of 14, and is a PhD candidate in applied economics at Northeastern for class of 2020. Rob lives in Bridgewater with his wife and three sons. Um, currently, we're experiencing a little uh, technical difficulty with our presenter. Um, so we will be back to you in just a moment um, with Rob.
<clears throat> All right, while we wait for uh, these kind of technical issues to be resolved, I figure might as well get going with a, a few of these things uh, so everybody's not waiting for too long. Um, and then once they're resolved, hopefully we can get right into uh, Professor Hannah's presentation. Um, so first I wanna thank Alexis uh, for having me and uh, for the alumni office to, to have me to host this. This is um, obviously a really relevant topic um, and uh, you know, Professor Hannah's perspective is um, uh, unique in, in the fact that he, he focuses um, his research completely on the town of Bridgewater. Um, so for, we're in for a real treat in terms of uh, the, the kind of content that he's gonna cover. And I mean, obviously we've all lived through kind of an unprecedented response to what feels like an unprecedented global pandemic. Um, but as we'll see today, the, the pandemic itself is not actually unprecedented. Um, and even a lot of the ways that we've responded to this pandemic isn't unprecedented either. Um, so it's one of kind of the fascinating things that we'll see here today is that um, history does repeat itself a bit. Um, and we've learned some lessons from our past experience, but we did not uh, learn all of the lessons that we, we maybe should have. Um, and so while we wait, I'm just gonna introduce um, Professor Hannah. So William Hannah holds a doctorate in history from Boston College. He spent 37 years in Taunton Public Schools as a teacher and curriculum supervisor. He has also been a visiting lecturer in the history department at Bridgewater State University for more than two decades. He speaks and writes widely on New England history and his book, Abraham Among the Yankees, Lincoln's 1848 visit to Massachusetts was recently released by the University of Southern Illinois Press. Uh, Professor Hanna has also written his, a history of Taunton, Massachusetts, and he yeah. presently serves as president of the Old Colony History Museum in Come Taunton. On. <clears throat> and it looks like perfect timing, uh, Professor Hanna. I just finished your bio. Um, so I hope it was a good one. <laughs> I made the entire thing up and you'll never know what I said. Uh, um, well, uh, without further ado, why don't we uh, turn it over to you for uh, your presentation on uh, Bridgewater in the influenza epidemic of 1918. Okay. Can everybody hear me all right? I think so. Well, let's, yeah. talk, for a, let's talk for a few minutes about um, the epidemic itself and how it affected Bridgewater. Uh, first of all, um, this as occurs probably with COVID, came in stages. Uh, there was a, an outbreak of influenza in 1918 in the springtime, uh, subsided and came back with a vengeance in the fall. Uh, when we look at the, a comparison between 1918 and 2020, we see that the influenza epidemic of 1918 was devastating. Uh, somewhere between 40 million and 100 million people worldwide died. Uh, more than half a million, probably 550,000 or so Americans died. Uh, 46,000 Massachusetts people died. So we see that uh, all, as bad as we are today, we see that there was a time in 1918 when it was uh, considerably worse. Um, what was different in 1918 is that the United States was involved in World War I, and that uh, affected the way that the uh, country handled that epidemic. Uh, the President of the United States was Woodrow Wilson, um, second term president, and it's interesting now when we compare the, uh, the two times, Woodrow Wilson, president of the United States, said not one public word about the flu epidemic that was raging around them. He caught the flu and still said nothing about uh, that pandemic. I was interested uh, particularly in Bridgewater. Uh, we'll get to that in a second, but I think to put that in some context, when we talk about World War I, um, there were 32 army training camps around the United States preparing soldiers for World War I service. The largest in this area was Ayer, Massachusetts, Fort Devens. Um, that held about 50,000 men. Many of those men were uh, farmers coming from the western part of the state, as well as from around the United States, many of those guys had zero immunity for contagious disease. 
And you can see that in American history throughout. The same thing was true in the Civil War. If you look at the soldiers who died in the Civil War, in the Civil War camps, many of them were farm boys who had uh, never experienced city life, had never uh, achieved any type of immunity and so forth. At Fort Devens, the uh, base hospital was, um, was capable of holding 2,000 uh, soldiers. By the time this flu epidemic ran its course in October of 1918, for example, it held 8,000. And you can see uh, some of the um, doctors who had come back from the Western Front, or who had come back from France and Belgium, compared what they saw in Camp Devon's hospital with what they had seen on the, uh, on the Western Front. Uh, would you hold on one? The, my window is open and the kids across the street are playing. Just let, take a quick time out. If it's not the kids across the street, it's the kids in the house. So uh, I'm on mute because you could probably hear my kids <laughs> if I wasn't. So. Okay, we're practicing little social distancing on Duffy Drive and Taunton, as you may imagine. Um, if you look at the United States Army during, during this period, uh, it was estimated that about 36% of all American soldiers uh, contracted this uh, pneumonia and about 40% of United States Naval personnel uh, contracted it. All in all, that's more than 620,000 American servicemen who were affected. So dramatic was this that the United States suspended the draft, uh, which was a, a drastic thing to do. So let's look at Bridgewater. Uh, Bridgewater population, large immigrant population, uh, industrial workers, many of them shoe workers, some who worked in, uh, in the iron forge in Bridgewater. I read an interesting piece the other day which, in which uh, it compares the susceptibility of people in 2020 to the susceptibility of people in 1918. And you can see basically the same patterns. Densely populated areas are affected most dramatically. Uh, immigrant uh, families whose culture in time of stress brought families together, placed added burden on uh, public health facilities. Nativism, xenophobia, uh, added to their sense of isolation. And uh, they died in larger numbers than uh, other Americans. Because it was World War I, American resources were already stretched as thin as they could be. Um, federal government in those days played a much smaller role in the lives of average Americans than it does today. The first uh, reports that you see of uh, the flu in Bridgewater actually come in the newspapers in Brockton, Massachusetts. Uh, they had a uh, correspondent uh, in Bridgewater who reported almost every day, and it's, and it's really interesting to look at that. Um, when you see it in Bridgewater, you begin to see it, first of all, in the shoe factory. Uh, those of us who are familiar with Bridgewater know the mall. Uh, and I call it a mall, the, uh, the area where um, Roach Brothers is and uh, the uh, McDonald's and so forth. Well, there was a large shoe company there at, at that time. And because of the war, they were working on um, defense contracts and they were working three shifts. So that place was going many times, uh, 24 hours a day with immigrant labor. And in those days, uh, many of the people who worked in those shoe factories lived within uh, a five minute walk. So you begin to see downtown Bridgewater affected. One of the things which was interesting to me is the, the fact that Massachusetts generally was not um, prepared to respond publicly and quickly. You know, one of the things which happened in Bridgewater and happened everywhere else is you did not pick up the newspaper every day and see how you could minimize or mitigate the opportunity for you to catch this disease because the government was 
concerned primarily, first and foremost, with propaganda, with uh, building morale and keeping morale uh, for the war effort. So uh, the federal government was largely silent on it. There was no Dr. Fauci, uh, there was no Dr. Burks, the CDC was far in the future. So it was left primarily to states and uh, disproportionately to locals to see how they were going to handle that. In Massachusetts, uh, it they, we were slow to respond. Uh, for example, they didn't close the schools uh, until this uh, was well underway. The, this began to show up at the end of August, the beginning of September. They didn't close the schools until the third week of September. Also, they didn't close the theaters until shortly after that. So you had a, uh, a positive brew of uh, influenza, uh, even in a little place like Bridgewater. The college closed. Now, the college in those days was much smaller than it is now. There have been very few students at Bridgewater, in those days, Bridgewater State Normal School. Very few of those students stayed on campus. Many of them went home. They were, they were commuters who went home every day, and some had shared rooms in the, in the downtown area. So the college shut down. Uh, but as, in, as today, the infrastructure of the college had to remain. There were, in those days, as today, essential workers. They had, to, they had to keep the college running. And it's interesting to me that although classes were suspended and the library was closed, there were students at Bridgewater State Normal School who came to the college every day to volunteer to do what needed to be done, to open the doors and lock the doors, to make sure that the, uh, the furnace uh, ran for hot water, um, to make sure that the electricity stayed on and so forth. But school was out. Uh, which was interesting also because in those days, as today, they had student teaching. Uh, they, had, they had educators. In fact, in those days, Bridgewater was almost exclusively a teacher's training school. So those people who were out for student teaching in 1918 had just gone out. School had just started when this, when this began. And um, there was... Um, you know, confusion, and, and just like today, there was confusion and uncertainty about what the future would bring to them. Schools in the Bridgewater area and in Massachusetts uh, were closed for not nearly as long as our schools have been closed right now. They eventually got back. We can talk about going back too early, which many places did. Um, but the campus was closed with the exception of um, some volunteers. I saw a figure, I don't, I don't give it much credence, but I did see a figure of the number of people uh, who worked on campus who were stricken with the flu. It seemed to be no greater, no less or more than you know, the average uh, um, town in Bridgewater. Uh, September 28th in Bridgewater, from then on, there were no public funerals. Very interesting to see, uh, beginning then, that advertisements in newspapers for flower shops and uh, for uh, funeral directors went up. In those days, there was no such thing as a funeral home. In those days, people were buried from the house, which drove public health officials in Bridgewater and in Brockton and in Taunton and in Boston crazy. Because um, particularly among the immigrants, when someone dies, everybody gathers at that house. Uh, the director of uh, public health, uh, board of health in Bridgewater kept, uh, if we look at it today, it seems that he, you know, he was unduly harsh with the immigrants, but they couldn't get those immigrants out of those houses. Uh, many times they wouldn't call a funeral director until more than 24 hours after the person had died. So, so that's, um, you know, a, a problem that existed uh, uh, a lot. Newspapers, commentators, afraid to run stories critical of state or local uh, uh, caring, because uh, in those days, uh, they were very much afraid that it would be, uh, they would be uh, punished by the government. 
um, sedition laws were in place uh, and, and just public opinion didn't, didn't support that. So you would not pick up the um, story that the government was slow or, or not responsive. Um, in Bridgewater, as in the rest of Massachusetts, excuse me, of all of the play, of all of the times for spam, cold calls, Rob, of all of the time for cold calls, this is, uh, this is not the one. Um, they were very, they're very careful of, of criticizing. Uh, if you look at the apex, or if you look, uh, I guess, I guess they've called it the, uh, the peak of pinnacle now, uh, that came uh, in the first week in October of 1918. Uh, in October of 1918, Boston, just Boston, was losing 250 people a day uh, to, the, to the flu. Uh, October 1918 is the deadliest month in American history. 195,000 Americans died just of the flu. And what's interesting about that is it was almost certainly higher because in Massachusetts, for example, this uh, pandemic began in the early part of September. Doctors who treated uh, victims, and in those days it was house call, doctors who treated victims didn't have to report flu deaths until October 3rd. So it's almost a month of pandemic before any reporting has to be done. Uh, so, so clearly, if you look at, for example, if you look at the um, uh, public health records for Bridgewater, you'll see that uh, there are lots of uh, people listed as dead of the flu, but you'll also see that there are as many more uh, listed as dead of pneumonia. The chances are almost certain that some or all of those pneumonia deaths were also deaths from the flu. So. What did Bridgewater do? Uh, the first thing they did was they uh, looked at the, um, they looked to the director of public health in Bridgewater, Board of Health, and that was Dr. Albert Hunt. Those of us familiar with the Bridgewater campus know that Hunt Hall uh, is named for him. If you're familiar with Hunt Hall, and I'm sure that just about everybody on this uh, webinar is, you know that uh, Hunt Hall is located quite near the fire station in Bridgewater. And between the fire station and Hunt Hall, there is what used to be quite a beautiful mansion. That was Dr. Hunt's house, Hunt Hall named for him. He was the uh, director of public health in Bridgewater. And they looked to him to lead this, uh, you know, this fight. The first thing they did is they, they closed the schools, they closed the theater, they did away with public funerals, et cetera. And in, in those days too, it was unusual for hospitals to accept patients that had contagious disease. Um, they would be treated at home. Uh, they would be quarantined. In Bridgewater, they started, uh, they organized two emergency hospitals both of the houses that they used for emergency hospitals are still standing. One uh, is, was, is still is down by the uh, old ironworks uh, in Bridgewater. You can see it, it's a big house. Um, they turned that into a uh, hospital for eight beds. And the other one was much closer to campus. Uh, it, would, it was almost across the street from the Swedenborgian church which is uh, in the center of Bridgewater. Uh, and that, I, th I believe, was a, uh, a, a temporary hospital for uh, six to eight people. Many of the people who weren't hospitalized but who were still sick were unable to take care of themselves. They were uh, uh, unable to cook. They were unable to wash. They were unable to take care of their children and so forth and so on. So they asked for volunteers. The biggest shortage in Bridgewater and anywhere during uh, this in, uh, influenza epidemic was nurses. They needed nurses. They asked for volunteer nurses, uh, and they got a pretty good uh, turnout. Those people would agree to cook extra meals. 
uh, they would agree to um, sew masks. Like today, people were encouraged to wear masks. If you look at the uh, the uh, steps that they thought would avoid this, they're, they're, some, they're somewhat primitive. For example, the first one was don't kiss, uh, wear a mask, uh, et cetera. They had women sewing masks. And they also had men uh, who volunteered to take uh, hot meals in their automobiles to deliver hot meals. Now, the return out of Bridgewater was good. Uh, it was, uh, 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 in many cases, an 18 or 20 hour, these people worked 18 to 20 hour shifts. Uh, they would do that. Uh, all pharmacies were closed, uh, along with um, pool halls and any place, soda fountains, the places you would get service of any kind. So they agreed also to deliver medicine. Uh, then there was no cure for this. The only thing that you could do was you would treat the symptoms uh, rather than try to cure the disease. Uh, so they sent people into the homes and into the uh, temporary hospitals to try to, to do what they could. They also cracked down in uh, the immigrant communities. Uh, they sent, in those days, there was no, uh, the equivalent of the National Guard in those days, what was called the State Guard. They were sent in to quarantine the homes of the immigrants uh, who lived densely packed into uh, the, the tenements that serviced the shoe industry. So you, what, would, what you would find, interestingly enough, would be there would be five or six, uh, largely Italians, a lot of Italians and a lot of Eastern Europeans as well, but the Italians seem to be the target. But you would see five or six unmarried Italian guys sharing a room in one of these rooming houses. If somebody got sick in that rooming house, the rooming house was quarantined. These other guys couldn't go to work. They couldn't leave. And if they had been outside the house when the place was quarantined, they couldn't get back in. So you had some people who were homeless, uh, who had to uh, impose on friends or family. And these people obviously were as contagious as everyone else. So that becomes uh, a, a real issue and a real uh, problem. Uh, they patrolled the streets in the immigrant communities. Uh, they would arrest people who broke the curfew. Uh, I didn't see too many um, uh, instances of arrest. I think they were just, you know, they were, they were interested in um, trying to get people off the streets. It's also interesting at Bridgewater, the, the people who were looking for the cause, I mean, we all wanted to blame somebody, right? We all, we all, we all can't believe that some, even today, that some disaster like this could descend on a, on a modern industrialized country. Well, they couldn't believe that either. And like us today, they liked conspiracy theories. Uh, one conspiracy theory that ran through the whole place was that the Germans had unloaded a submarine. And these, some of these are pretty good. The Germans had unloaded a submarine uh, either on the North Shore or above Boston or someplace on the Cape. And that these German uh, agents, had walked into the big cities uh, of Boston, for example, um, with uh, material that had somehow contained influenza uh, germs and had in fact planted this disease among us. And uh, it was a German hoax, uh, a German uh, uh, weapon. Also, uh, there was a good deal of um, suspicion that the Bayer Company, Bayer Aspirin, uh, that's a German company. And uh, there was a uh, belief for a while that uh, the Bayer company in Germany had infected aspirin with influenza and had uh, infiltrated that into the um, United States. In those days, you don't, you don't talk about uh, agents, you don't talk about infiltration, you don't talk about foreign danger, because that flies in the face of uh, what people want to hear in a wartime, and also what the government wants to put out. So, so there's no uh, free discussion, there's no uh, some surmising about what this could be. Uh, it's all, it's all kept quite quiet, and it's all kept um, locally. So in 
if I take a look uh, at the end of this, uh, a number of things are going to happen at the end of the epidemic in the United States, and I think that many of them are interesting. Because this disease swept through immigrant communities, Bridgewater is an excellent example. You see for the first time in the 1920s, right after the war, uh, beginning of um, restrictions, people calling for um, con Congress to pass uh, restrictive immigration laws. And in fact, one is passed in 1924. We have never lacked in this country. We've never been in a shortage of xenophobia in this country, nativism. And the flu epidemic uh, gave ammunition to people who uh, wanted to further restrict immigration, and which, which they did in 1924. Um, also, uh, you can see uh, after this that they began to think more seriously about public health. The state of Massachusetts uh, uh, began to think more closely about what would happen in the next, if the next time came. The, the peak of this was in October of 1918. It subsided and it came back uh, in, in lesser virulent times uh, within the next two or three months. So in fact, the, the entire uh, effect of this was not gone until well into 1919. So what you see by the time the, this is over is that uh, there are about, as I say, somewhere, um, somewhere between 40 and you know, 100 million deaths, uh, someplace between 550,000 and 670,000 uh, deaths in the United States. One of the things which is most interesting about this epidemic, and you can see it in Bridgewater, most people who die of the flu year in and year out are the very young or the very old. Those people who have uh, pre-existing health conditions. That is not the way that it happened in, 19, in 1918. This flu took people in the prime of their lives. It focused, targeted those people you would least expect to die of, of the flu. Uh, in Bridgewater, I think I worked it out. I think that the average age of death in Bridgewater was something like 32. Um, so, so that was uh, interesting. So what they tried to do is, if you take a look at that figure, by the way, let's say, let's say 550,000. Um, that's more people, Americans, who died than who died in World Wars I, World War II, and Vietnam combined. And I think that's that's interesting because because we were in a wartime situation that tended to get lost in the in the discussion of american history it's only recently that people have begun to study pandemics and it's only recently that the that the flu epidemic of 1918 gets any type of sustained attention and that's because uh, it was sandwiched between the world war and the 1920s which has its own history um, but, but the number of people and the age of people at which they died was interesting. Another uh, effect of this is, and I, the last time you and I talked about this, I think we, we talked about um, the effects of it uh, as a society. If you take a look at Europe after the Black Death of the 1300s, which was the closest pandemic uh, in history to the flu epidemic, if you take a look at what happened after the Black Death, you can see that there was there was profound societal changes after that, and that's because uh, traditional the traditional view that people had toward life broke down. For example, uh, in after the uh, uh, Black Plague, uh, all traditional morality, sexuality broke down. Uh, there was a, a, a period of great sexual license. Uh, the crime rates went up. And the whole idea after that was live for today because tomorrow you may be dead. There was, a, in, in the period following the Black Plague, a, a, an anti-clericalism went through Europe. Uh, churches, uh, 
priests were were disrespected because these people figured if these people can't save us, if they can't get God to help us, then all is lost. Interestingly, the same thing happened on a smaller scale in after the flu epidemic. Uh, if you take a look at the 1920s, sexual license, uh, lawlessness, crime rate went up, general disrespect of authority, uh, that seems to follow huge cataclysmic human tragedy. And it'll be interesting to see uh, if that follows uh, for this as well. Um, one of the things which has not been studied uh, as closely as it could, and I think it, I think it would be interesting, is uh, the number of caregivers who died in the flu epidemic. Uh, we see stories now every day of doctors and nurses who are working in major hospitals with COVID-19, and these people uh, fight the fight every single day. Some of them die, as we have seen. My guess would be that in the flu epidemic of 1918, you would be, we would be very, very, uh, we would be stunned if we had a way to look uh, objectively and completely at um, how many died during that time. In those days, uh, nurses training was not what it is today. Um, the idea of getting a nursing degree in those days was not what it is, nor was the, uh, the knowledge of uh, contagious disease. And I, I would sure that you would find that um, the, the death toll among these people in Massachusetts was staggering. In Bridgewater, Bridgewater sent out uh, a call for help for nurses. And interestingly, the federal government sent one. Uh, she worked here for, I think, uh, maybe four or five days uh, at the worst of it, um, and, uh, and then went back to, I, I think she was from New York. They also sent a doctor. But doctors were powerless because there was no cure. Uh, the only thing that anybody could treat, and you could treat one as the, the, a high school kid could treat somebody as effectively as a, a medical doctor because all you were doing was treating the, the symptoms. So, so the medical community was... Um, was, was hard pressed. Uh, so what can we say about the, re and this is, I think what makes this relevant. What can we say about the uh, response, a comparison of response between 1918 and 2020? The last time we talked, um, I, I said to you that it was like asking somebody to compare who was the greatest ball player. Was it Babe Ruth or was it Mickey Mantle or whatever? And that's really hard to do uh, because they played in different eras. And I, I've already mentioned the fact that the federal government in those days played a much smaller role in American lives uh, than it does today. Uh, it's only with the New Deal in the 1930s that the federal government becomes uh, more of a presence in our lives. So in that respect, uh, the people in 1918 did not have the expectations of federal help that, that we have today. But one thing is really interesting, and it's something that I've seen since I talked to you the last time, and that is there were attempts in 1918 to impress upon people how important and how valuable social distancing was. And one of the things, one of the studies that has come out of the uh, the uh, study of 1918 is that those places which were most successful in social distancing also had the lower number of uh, flu deaths. The, one of the best uh, uh, records came from St. Louis, uh, in which they were largely shut down and they stayed shut down for a longer time. They had a, a smaller death rate than Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which had one of the highest in the nation. And it was, it was impressed upon them as much as possible to don't go to the theater, don't, don't go to church. And again, they had the same agitation in 1918 about church service that we see today. And like today, there were some people, many people in 1918 who felt that the, the restrictions that had been placed by cities and towns on citizens were too harsh, unconstitutional, et cetera. But the figures have shown that those places which closed down tightest 
and opened up latest, did better uh, all in all with, uh, with flu deaths. Um, I, I find it interesting. I think the, the greatest rate of death in American cities in 1918 and 19 was Pittsburgh. You wouldn't think that. You would think New York or you would think Washington, D.C. or someplace. But, but that's not the way, apparently, that, uh, the study that I saw that that, that turned out. And, and you would think, I would think, that St. Louis would not be among the places which would show the best record. In any event, one of the things that we learned, I think there are a number of things that we learned from 1918 that we may or may not have practiced now. And one is uh, recognize the situation early. In neither 1918 nor 2020 did we recognize the situation early. Uh, second, uh, in the case of the federal government in 1918, there was suppression of facts and information and health news. In 2020, there may have been a, a, an abundance of, an, an overabundance of it, but the government, federal government needs to tell people the truth so that they can make uh, judgments for themselves on how they're gonna handle this. And third, uh, don't, don't unlock too soon. Don't, don't listen to uh, those people who are perhaps just only interested in uh, opening up the casino or whatever, because uh, studies have shown, including the new one, that in 1918, uh, that didn't work as well as it could. We hear now news that uh, there could be peaks, another peak or another spike because of the early opening. If that's true, that, had, that mirrors what happened in 1918 as well. Uh, so what did Bridgewater get out of this? Interestingly, they got something out of it. Uh, the uh, shoe companies uh, and the iron company got together and they hired a nurse for, for this uh, crisis. And after the crisis, they kept, they kept her on. Uh, so, so this got Bridgewater a public health nurse after the, after the horse was well out of the barn and, and she was uh, on for a while. Lots of people uh, say always now, uh, what effect did the flu epidemic have on the lives of people in Bridgewater in 1918? And the answer is probably day to day, not much. Um, because of the war, there was no such thing as an essential worker. Everybody was an essential worker. All of the shoe, shoe companies and all of the iron companies and all of the industries, textile industries in Southeastern Massachusetts uh, could not have closed down if they wanted. Some of them, because of the uh, epidemic, went on reduced work, one shift, one and a half shifts, because simply they didn't have the people to man the whole thing. But if I were a school kid in Bridgewater, Massachusetts in 1918, I would get out of school. Uh, I think the schools were closed and all for between three and four weeks. Um, and then it would be back to the movies and back to the soda fountain and back to everything else. If I were a worker, uh, I, would, I would never leave. I've never left work. What it did is uh, it did bring tragedy. I think the death toll for Bridgewater, I believe, was 46, I think, or something like that. But my guess would be it was much higher than that. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll never know that. It brought no foreboding of what could happen. Uh, if you take a look at these people, they went into the 1920s lived well in the 1920s, unless you were an immigrant, lived well in the 1920s. There was prosperity throughout the 20s, particularly in a place like Bridgewater. Uh, and then the depression comes. So they, those people who had been children in the time of the flu epidemic now become adults in the time of the depression. And by the time they graduate from high school, World War II is on us and off they go. So I think when they look back, they look back on it. Uh, if they lost someone in their family, they certainly look back at that. But other than that, it doesn't appear to have been uh, a huge disruption in their lives. There are some studies which show that uh, clinical depression was up uh, after this, but that, that could have been caused by the uh, epidemic or it could have been caused by just uh, how difficult life was in those days. I think maybe this is a good place to stop. Just you've covered a ton of ground and yeah. I do want to leave time for people to ask questions. Okay. Um, so, um, I mean, the parallels are kind of fascinating and, and 
um, there's almost fewer differences than you might expect between what happened then and, and what's happened recently. Um, your comment at the end about um, the, just the context of being happening during World War I and then by the time some of these, somebody was a kid during the Spanish flu, um, graduated high school, it was the Great Depression and then potentially off to war. I mean, you can understand why this this might not have kind of as large a loom as large as it, you might think it would historically because of that. And it makes me think honestly about, um, you know, the kind of civil unrest that's that's happening today, um, which, you know, may be part of is, is because of the fact that we are all at home in quarantine. So maybe it is actually partially a result of, or at least the amount of unrest is partially a result of what's happening. But you wonder when we look back at uh, 2020, what what grabs the headline, you know, 50 years from now, what are we yeah. talking about? Um, so I have a couple, you know, just reactions to, I mean, first thing, as you said, healthcare workers have been heroes always, uh, even a right. hundred years ago. Right. Absolutely selfless. It's, it's really uh, amazing. Um, and also conspiracy theories. <laughs> we, spent around. we love them. We can't get away from them. I know. I know. I love the yeah. uh, the story about the Germans landing on the Cape. I'm from the Cape yeah. originally, so it's yeah. uh, it's. I love imagining that. Uh, you know, I, I would be at the beach, and some Germans would come uh, swimming out of the water with. Uh, you, know, you know, it's also it's also interesting, <laughs> Rob, to think that they got actually reports of people seeing German submarines <laughs> <laughs> dropping people dropping spies off off Chatham or whatever. I mean. Probably what seals. They, what, That's what my guess. They, what did they see? Is what I want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, you know, they're that. I would be curious to see what the what they saw. I suppose that you you that did happen where you would actually see German U boats or something. But that's again, I don't know. Oh how yeah, much that is you, you, yeah. They fired on uh, on the Cape. That's but, right. That's yeah. right. Maybe you told me that. But um, it, the first, I got a couple of questions that I want to start with. And then we have some questions coming in, so I'll make oh. sure to get there. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is just mention, uh, you know, the, the xenophobia that you mentioned and that there was, um, you know, this kind of pre-built susceptibility to the, um, uh, the flu because of the way that, uh, you know, immigrant workers were yep. um, housed and, and just the fact that they're working in factories together and living right, right by the factories, right. Right. not spreading out at all. Um, and so in terms of the response I don't know if you can speak to this kind of nationally. Um, we Somebody already asked the question, so I'll, I'll include this as part of my question. So why was it called the Spanish flu? Oh, good question. Does it have anything to do with xenophobia? Um, and is can you talk maybe a little bit about in general, how you know what was the overall uh, position of people in reacting to what was called the, the Spanish flu? Or did that name come later? No, it, it didn't come later. It came at the time and it had no relationship to reality in any fashion. Uh, in fact, we think, and we're pretty sure that the flu uh, came from Europe uh, and it came through ports, uh, Boston being amongst them, with servicemen. Uh, this, the flu absolutely ravaged uh, port cities and uh, that had nothing to do with Spain. Um, how that got the name Spanish flu, some that just dreams, it, there was a rumor or there was a, a, a belief that it had come from uh, Spain where there had been an outbreak. This was a worldwide phenomenon, as I said. And it's most interesting because they could have called it the, uh, the, uh, Asian, uh, the uh, Eskimo flu because there were um, villages, isolated villages around the world where people died of this. So to isolate it in, uh, to, to point the finger at Spain or anywhere else is just, is just poppycock. Yeah. Um, we have to brand these things, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Um, LA, well, what, what are we calling? Uh, we're calling COVID the Chinese flu now, aren't we? Isn't, isn't that? Uh, well, it's, isn't that uh, at least one person is trying to call it the Chinese. Yeah. 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 So that question was from Stella and she actually has a follow-up question, which I think sure. is, is a good segue too, which is why mostly Italian immigrants um, I think maybe you were speaking about the pop, the immigrant population in Bridgewater, but uh, yes, 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 just Bridgewater. Uh, oh. There was a there was a, a widespread uh, Italian population throughout much of southeastern Massachusetts. Um, they followed the jobs, and they followed uh, they followed their families who had been here before. They followed the jobs and uh, settled primarily in cities. I mean, it's going to be Sacco and Vanzetti that uh, become the uh, you know, the, 
uh, xenophobia target uh, in just a little while after this, uh, after this epidemic. So there were large numbers of, um, of Italians here working in the shoe industry. They were also uh, very, many of them very talented stone workers. So there was a, a need for their uh, skills. There were also some Eastern Europeans, um, Polish uh, and others, but uh, I, I, my guess would be that they were more Italian than anybody anywhere else. Gotcha. Um, so another, we have a question from Emily. Um, so in eight, 1918 in particular, how long was the, did the pandemic last? I think there was two waves, like a short one in the spring and then the fall. There was a, short, there was a shorter one in the spring. There was the, the brutal one in the fall, which went pretty much from the first week of September through October. Uh, then that subsided and there was a smaller one in the spring. Uh, and then there was a smaller one, even smaller uh, in the fall. So, so all in all, I think they, they take uh, the, the end of it, um, 1921 maybe. It, it kept recurring in smaller outbreaks uh, as time went on. I think that's encouraging. I, maybe this is just me as an optimist, but uh, I, basically I, it, it's, you have no real you know, kind of uh, overall strategy in terms of response nationally, no. globally. Um, and as you said, you know, the best you could do is basically treat the symptoms and mm -hmm. wear masks, which is, we, we know helps, but um, you know, that's, that is a long period of time. And part of, part of um, uh, the question was basically, do we think this is something we can use to kind of um, gauge our expectations for now? And I think if anything, you know, obviously we're in different pandemics, but maybe, um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but maybe the, what we can see from that is that at least in terms of reacting to an infectious disease, if this one lasted three years, we should hope this, the, the coronavirus will be uh, shorter than that. We, we should hope that. Yeah. yeah, we should. You know, we certainly know more now than we did then. Uh, medical science is, is exponentially better than it was. It's interesting though, I mean, the way these people, in 1918, there was, there was no way that they were gonna cure it. The best they could do was hide from it. Mm. Uh, and that's what social distancing is. It's, you're hiding from the disease. You're trying to put yourself out of its way. That hasn't changed uh, in 2020. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that somebody uh, after we finish with this are, is gonna have a, a, an interesting time comparing the differences and the, the similarities. Yeah. Yeah. There'll be, I think, plenty of, plenty of research on that. And, you know, one of the things that's pretty stark is um, I saw a, an interview with uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci from like three years ago, where he was talking about if there was a global pandemic and what the response would be. And obviously it's exactly what the response has been. So this is not something we didn't know how to respond to. And I, I think a big part of that is probably our experience here um, and also other kind of uh, epidemics that have popped up around the world. Mm. Um, so we have uh, a question from Janine. Um, was there any indication there's animal involvement in the, the spread of the pandemic? So oh, that's a good question. Yeah. That's a good question. Animal or insect not, transmission? Not that I know. No, not in, no, no. It was, it was person to person. That's interesting. Yeah, obviously there are types of flu that can kind of uh, oh, yeah. pass between species. So. Yes, yeah. Uh, zoonotic flu is uh, among the deadliest. Bird flu, swine flu. But yes. uh, there was, there's no evidence that that, that took place. Part, any part in 1918. Um, so, da, 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 da. I'm curious. So, Woodrow Wilson got the flu. You said he didn't say anything about the flu. Um, was there Not any? Yeah. Did was there awareness publicly that he was sick or had the flu? Uh, he kind of famously also was it during the time when he was. You have to remind me. Um, he he was I think traveling to. Yes promote the League of Nations, right? And no, he was in Paris for the, uh, for the uh, Paris Peace Conference. That's what it was. Okay, um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, was it widely publicized? No, not at all. Uh, he came back uh, and there's pretty good evidence that he never really recovered because he had a devastating stroke, as you probably know, just, just mm. a short time after he you know, came back to, went, to go on this campaign of convincing the people in the Senate to approve the Versailles Treaty. But no, he, he didn't say anything. Yeah, he had not one, not one public word about 
Yeah. I mean, obviously very different times. And I just, uh, so everybody knows we're, we're a minute over time. Um, Bill, if you have a few more minutes, we'll take sure, a I couple do. more questions Absolutely. Um, yeah. and uh, then, then maybe we'll wrap up. But um, <clears throat> in Stella, I see your, your uh, questions. I, I do want to bring these up to Bill, but uh, first uh, Marianne has a question. Uh, were medical devices such as ventilators used back then or something similar, something to aid in breathing? No. Um, and then, yeah, so was there limitations in terms of access to hospitals and things like that? Yes. Uh, based on income and, and social standing? Uh, not so much, I think, on income and social standing. Hospitals in those days obviously were much smaller than they are right now. Yeah. Most of them were not uh, equipped to handle contagious diseases. So they ended up making temporary hospitals. But in, uh, my guess would be that that didn't matter very much because, again, you're just treating symptoms. Uh, there's no such thing as a ventilator in those days. There's no such thing as uh, oxygen uh, administered in the form that we would know it. So it was a, pretty much a place to make people more comfortable, to make sure they got fluids, and to hope for the best. That's, uh, you know, it, that's one of the things I think that is is also hopeful about now is that at the very least, the treatment of the symptoms has gotten better. So you yeah. probably have, you know, a more likely chance to survive, even with uh, uh, COVID, which is is apparently very deadly. So um, it, one, I, we have a question from Lisa, and maybe this will be um, kind of our last official question. And, and if anybody has further questions, feel free to send them along. <clears throat> and we can always follow up uh, after after the fact. And so you can the, also, also, you could email me directly if, if they have questions, whanna uh, at bridge.edu. Perfect. This is this is the good thing. We, so for everybody, um, uh, I'm sure you heard Bill say the last time we spoke. So Bill gave this presentation at State Street for our uh, alumni network, um, and that's one thing I I couldn't do or didn't want to do was give out your email to all of those no, that's folks. Fine. <laughs> okay, maybe I will after. But uh, but yeah, we're all friends here. So um, uh, so last question is from Lisa. Um, did the more wealthy sections in town get policed for the curfew violations? You mentioned the kind of immigrant population. Right. So do you see any evidence uh, kind of outside of there? Um, and then any pushback to curfews uh, overall that you that No you and no. <clears throat> no, there no, the, uh, there was no pushback on curfews that I know of. And second, uh, the curfews, uh, the, the, the curfew had to do with um, movie theaters and public places. Uh, very little pushback, at least that I see in, in, the, in the press. Uh, the quarantine part existed only in the immigrant neighborhoods, and that's only where the, uh, the state guard or the, uh, the guard was to, to make sure that they, they stayed there. If I were a rich Bridgewateronian and I wanted to go out at night, I went. Yeah. I mean, both of those things uh, kind of make sense. It's a weird juxtaposition, too, because you might expect that at a time where the government, certainly federal government, has less involvement in your life. So you're, you're kind of maybe um, more used to being independent and uh, having nobody have any say over your life, at least if you're wealthy, certainly. Mm -hmm. You might think there'd be pushback, at least to the idea of a curfew. But I guess the pushback is, I just ignore it. <laughs> Go about yeah. my, my life as oh, if nothing's sure, happening. But also, there are far fewer <clears throat> opportunities for entertainment in a place like Bridgewater in 1918 than there are even today. Very, very fair point. Very fair point. Um, okay, I think uh, maybe we'll, we'll stop there. Um, I, I certainly want to say thank you, Bill, uh, for your presentation. Um, and again, I want to thank uh, the alumni uh, office for inviting me and, and uh, having me here. Um, but I, I, now I want to turn it back over to Alexis uh, for some uh, closing comments. Thank you so much. Um, first, I definitely want to thank you, uh, Dr. Hannah, for your presentation today. Um, it was excellent and very informing. And um, also to Rob for facilitating the question and answer period. Um, we really appreciate both of your help with our first alumni. So thank you so much. My pleasure. And for all of our attendees, I just wanted to let you know that our next alumni in the series will take place on July 15th at 1230 PM. And it is entitled, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? The Anthem of the Great Depression and Its Meaning Today. And that will be presented by Dr. Lisa Krisoff Fem, Dean of the BSU College of Graduate Studies. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that the registration for that alumni will open later this week and can be accessed on our website, alumni.bridgew.edu. 
www.ebuc.edu under the event calendar. It will also be in our next monthly newsletter and via direct email that will be sent to all alumni. If you're not on our email list, please feel free to update your info on our website. And also, if you have any feedback on today's alumni, if you have any questions that you'd like to send to us, um, or if you have an idea for a future topic or presenter, we invite you to please share your thoughts with us by emailing alumni at bridgew.edu. Um, on behalf of the entire Alumni Relations Office, we thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you at our future virtual and in-person alumni events. Thank you so much.